Welcome to episode 6 of The Inner Sanctum, a Dark Yabbing vlog by yours truly. My name is Joe. Uh, it's been quite a few months since the last video, and uh, I do apologize for that, but I've been really, really busy since then. Um, as you can probably see just from a uh, few seconds in this video that I'm not hanging out in my usual area where I shoot these videos. In fact, I'm in the uh, upstairs area of my house, which is basically just... Uh, well, a room in the making. When we first bought this house, everything was just bare studs and everything. And the past several months, I put lots of insulation in up here. Uh, a bathroom's gotten framed out, and uh, lots of painting in this other bedroom over here, which is going to eventually be my reverse man cave in maybe another month or so. So I'm pretty excited about that. To have my own just private area in my this house, you know. Not that I, uh, you know, don't mind spending time with my woman, but everyone needs a. Uh, you know, a private little sanctuary, I think, in their homes, and I'm going to have that soon. We're both going to have it soon, so we're both super excited about it. So that bedroom's going to be done soon, and I'm really excited. This, however, is, well, this is several months away, and anyway, I'm just ranting here, so let's just skip past that. <laughs> anyway, it's good to be back, and I know I always say I'm going to make more videos uh, more frequently, and it seems like it's becoming uh, more months between each one, but now that winter's here, I think uh, we'll be able to probably start pounding these things out a little bit more frequently, and... Okay, I'm back where I should be, and we're familiar territory, and we're ready to get this thing going. So, I haven't really talked about my own music too much, in the, well, I have, but not really had at the time to really talk about a new release. So, this is my latest release under the Noctilucan meme, and it was released back in, oh, I believe mid, mid early September on the Noctivagan label, and it was a split release with a act from Russia known as Deep Dark, and uh, our split release is called Paginae Nigris which is Latin for Black Pages. Dimitri from Deep Dark first started uh, talking to me about doing this split probably in oh, late 2007 or January of this year. And uh, when he got in contact with me, he said he wanted to do a split basically in like a ritualistic, horror, ambient kind of style. At the time, I was listening to a lot of Corona Barathery CDs, so it just really made a, made a lot of sense to uh, do something in that style. And because I also kind of you know, had interest in the occult uh, years ago in my life. So, you know, it was uh, just something to give it a shot, see how these songs came on. And once I started writing songs for this, it uh, everything kind of flowed really easy, I think. I really had a lot of fun creating these four songs for a split. And, uh, you know, after everything was done, we sent it to Phil from Noctavaga, and he was thrilled, he loved it, he, and he wanted to release it. So we were super excited about that. And as I said, it got released back in probably mid-September, and uh, so far it's done pretty well on the label. I think uh, it's uh, gotten a lot of digital downloads, and probably a few people bought the CD too, which is great. So, yeah, I'm really excited about that, and it was just a really fun split CD to do. And my first kind of real split CD too. I had a, a real small digital split CD a couple of years ago, but didn't really, I don't really got too much attention. So this is my first kind of real split CD, so it was really cool. As soon as uh, Dimitri approached me about doing this split, he had already had his songs composed and ready to go, so he sent me his stuff, and I was amazed right from the get-go. And his four songs are just fantastic. I mean, just, you know, I really like Deep Dark. I think it's a project that there's a lot more attention, and everything Dimitri makes is just really fantastic. The guy's never really made a bad release. He's still, a, you know, a really underground artist, and I think he deserves to be on a bigger label, like Cryo Chamber or Cyclic Law. He's just... The guy makes great music all the time, and he makes a lot of music too, which is really fantastic, you know. Um, but his four songs in this record, Split, whatever you want to call it, are, you know, old and, you know, uh, kind of a familiar style that he does, you know, it's like, got this horror kind of vibe going, there's uh, some really melancholy piano, there's some industrial vibes, some deep, dro dark droning stuff, it's just awesome, I love it, and, uh, uh, you know, Dimitri, like I said, just makes great music. The guy really has a talent for dark ambient music, and the guy is uh, fantastic at it. Dimitri's four songs are also really cinematic. It's just uh, some of his probably his most cinematic songs to date, too. That's why, again, I say that you know this guy deserves to be on Cryo Chamber, a label like Cryo Chamber, I think, would love this kind of stuff because it has that nice cinematic edge and it's well produced and just everything's really great. Um, you know, and it's, uh, these songs sound like something that could be used as, you know, uh, background music to a sitcom or a movie. Really just, I mean, I don't really know what the, in, the influence for these songs were, but it's not hard to, you know, kind of in your mind visualize and create your own kind of story when you listen to them. And then that's really important when it comes to dark ambient music, if you can listen to it and just, uh, you know, really create your own little world when you listen to the songs that, you know, dark ambient artists create. As for my four songs, well, 
As I mentioned before, I had interest in the occult back in 2011, so it made a lot of sense to kind of, you know, go back to those days in my life and think about that. And, you know, it was a really brief thing. It was mostly just a, a catalyst of listening to way too much black metal at the time. But, you know, something I got interested, I bought some books, and, you know, it was cool. I had fun with it, you know. For a brief minute, it seemed like something I could actually, you know, believe in, I guess you could say, and follow, but it just ultimately... I think it's just, uh, I couldn't get into it, so whatever, you know. But it was interesting reflecting on it and creating songs kind of centered around that. So, one of the songs, uh, the Chile's Dissentious of Erno, um, was just a, was, a, was the first song that I composed for this, and uh, it was just a real fun song, using the Tibetan singing bowl and just making some really just kind of dark horror stuff, which I don't think my music has really kind of had those vibes before, so it's kind of different. My girlfriend Kara also did some really great uh, witchy, evil kind of uh, spoken parts and laughter game, which just, just sounded fantastic. So I was really excited about that. The second song on my split, "What a Horrible Night to Have a Curse," is a total tribute to Castlevania: Simon's Quest. And um, this is a game I got back in the late '80s when I was a kid. I mean, I still remember going to the store with my parents and buying and just being obsessed with and loving that game. And, one of my biggest regrets is actually selling a lot of my old Nintendo games uh, about 10 years ago when I made some money and I just, uh, oftentimes I really wish I could play those games again because I had so much fun with those games, just the memories, but whatever, they're gone now and it sucks, but I still love them, I still love Castlevania stuff, so this was just, this song was a tribute to that more than anything. So for this song I used some uh, nighttime summer ambience that I had recorded last summer and it, it worked really well. When I started creating this song I was just kind of thinking about, you know, the landscapes in the game and I wanted to create something very similar to that and just mixed it in with like these rain, rains, uh, some rainfield recordings I had made and all their just kind of dark, you know, horror kind of sounding uh, keyboard melodies I came up with and I was really happy with this song, it was pretty cool. Um, the Vague Kit Net of this World was just sort of more of a dark, droning piece. It's not as cinematic or active as the other songs, but I had a lot of fun with them. this one too. It's it's a more basic, kind of old school dark ambient, I guess, to an extent. But it was fun doing this one. It was a cool thing. Guy My Spirit is another one kind of going into this ritualistic, horror, dark ambient style, like Corona Barathra and other artists like that. Um, this one, I actually managed to find a really interesting Luciferian prayer online when on someone's old blog from about 10 years ago, and I probably should have emailed the guy and told him I was using it, but I did credit him in the booklet, so hopefully he won't get pissed off at me if he ever uh, happens to buy his album and sees his uh, Luciferian prayer in my music. Um, anyway, in the song, I uh, just kind of did, did this prayer and sort of a certain amount of my acting ability, which isn't very good. But I did it as best I could, and it turned out pretty cool, and it just made it kind of dramatic, and, you know, the whole piece had a good just vibe and really kind of crazy, um, you know, feeling like something really evil being conjured, at least that was what I was going for, so hopefully if you guys listen to the song, you'll understand, uh, you know, and dig it and like it for what it is. Then the last song is a, a collaborative piece, just a uh, little title track, Page 9 Egoist. And uh, for this one, it was a pretty simple affair. Me and Dimitri just passed this track back and forth, you know, a number of times until we were satisfied with it. And it just, you know, we were happy with the result. We had a good, just solid track. And I mean, it closes out the album on a good note, I think. And uh, this whole thing is about 71 minutes total. And uh, it's a really interesting, I think, fun it, CD. We had a good time with it. And uh, yeah. If you're interested in dark horror ambient, I think, uh, I mean, I know I probably sound a little arrogant saying it's a really great CD, but I, I'm just really happy with the CD. I'm really happy with everything turned out, and uh, if you guys are in that sort of thing, I hope you check it out. So as usual, I'm going to show you the artwork and the layout of everything involved in this release. Um, this release, like pretty much all Noctavaga releases, comes in this uh, basically simple cardboard digipack, I guess you could call it, of sorts, and it's in a plastic sleeve. Um, the cover artwork was created by Delirium Design, which I will show you right there. Actually, let me take out the plastic sleeve, if you probably see it a little better in case there's a reflection. It was created by Delirium Design, which you can see right here. And, uh, this, originally I was going to do the cover artwork for it, but kind of, when I was in the process of doing it, Dimitri from Deep Dark just kind of contacted me one day and said, Okay, the cover artwork's done, I got it done by De De Delirium Design, and I was like, okay. <laughs> cool. 
but uh, right from the get-go, he had the idea of having uh, basically an open book with some sort of, you know, Latin text on it. And so the name design was perfect. They really did a good job. Um, the printing for this actually came out a little bit darker than the original image, but whatever. I mean, that happens sometimes during the printing process. Um, the remaining artwork and photography was all done by me, and these were actually just older photographs and older artwork I had laid around, so it kind of worked out nicely anyway. Um, so one panel is deep dark with uh, just all the kind of information about the, the songs and uh, how they recorded, when they recorded, all that kind of stuff. And then the other panel is uh, right here. Um, it's interesting to note that uh, the artwork I used for mine was actually originally going to be used by this Finnish black metal band about four years ago. And then when I told them that I would be charging them $25 to use it, they freaked out and decided that they would not be working with me. So I guess apparently I'm just supposed to give my artwork away for free. Right. So that didn't happen, but I'm glad I was able to repurpose that artwork because I always kind of like that one a lot. Then the back cover, you can see here, I did that as well. And this was, you know, sort of, sort of, sort of originally planned as a cover artwork. But I'm glad it ended up being, you know, being used as that back cover anyway. So, you know, all the song titles are there. You know, pretty simple. But I like it. And then uh, the CD in a, in a black sleeve is just sort of a different version. Oops. Kind of just uh, another version of the front cover. So, you know, really simple. And, uh... Yeah, I mean, all of Noctavagon releases are pretty much like this. Some, there are some more, like, luxurious packages they do once in a while, but basically an average Noctavagon release is uh, in this card-style packaging, which is great. I mean, it's simple and effective, and it gets the job done, and it's just always great that, you know, someone believes in my music and wants to release it, and, you know, I can only say it's a pleasure working with Phil. He's a great guy, and he's a passionate dark ambient fan, or dark music fan in general, really, and, uh... You know, it's a great label, it just keeps getting bitter, uh, bitter, better and better over time, and yeah, it's definitely worth checking out this label if you haven't, because there's a ton of great records on this hell, on this release. Sorry. There's a ton of great records on this label. Well worth checking out. Alright. Next up is a really new project called Forest of Frogs from Salisbury, Maryland. Uh, Forest of Frogs is self-described by Dan Mumford as being raw, dark forest ambient, and frog drone. <laughs> Uh, which is a pretty unique thing, uh, which I'm not familiar with, but all of his songs sort of have this underlining frog theme to them to, co to coincide with uh, the name, I would assume. And uh, he makes a sort of, mm, I would guess, kind of uh, experimental, dark ambient, drone-style music that I've not exactly heard uh, anything exactly like it before, which is pretty interesting. Um, a lot of it has a lot of experimental tendencies, you know, there's uh, some weird noise parts and uh, some weird usage of like bass guitars and, uh, and uh, normal guitars as well, and of course there's like some really noisy, harsh industrial parts too, but a lot of it is just really just uh, slow, almost meditative droning uh, pieces that uh, I wouldn't say there's a whole lot of substance to them, but they still are interesting, they can really capture your attention if you really just kind of you know, uh, put yourself in a comfortable situation and can pay attention to the music. They really got a good uh, ability to take you uh, to places and kind of, you know, uh, you know, let you relax and chill out. The album in question is called Journey Through a Forest of Frog, a collection of ambient warts, volume two. And uh, I guess this is just sort of, uh, well, I guess a collection of his ambient creations, because he's had several digital releases since. Uh, June of this year, so he's been pretty productive with music, and uh, I guess it's just a collection of you know, his favorite songs so far. Um, it kind of comes in this, I guess, you know, it's self-released uh, CDR where basically he painted the CDR, as you can see right here, and uh, and then the reverse side right there, plus that cover. So each one is totally unique in what you get, and uh, so obviously, you know, it's pretty cool there. I think he did like 10 copies of these all together, and he sent this one to me. So I'm kind of sorry for the delay in getting to this, Dan, but, uh, you know, I've been busy with a lot of stuff, so sorry about that. Anyway, I mean, that, that kind of sums up the Forrester Frog sound. I mean, it's just, you know, really droney, really uh, long songs. The first song, Yami, is almost 20 minutes long. The clock's at 17 minutes long. It's just, you know, slowly builds, and it, in a weird sort of way, it actually kind of reminds me of some of the the older uh, 
the current 93 stuff, I mean, it's probably not an influence, it's probably a rev. I mean, Dan probably doesn't even know who it is, maybe, well, maybe they do. But it just kind of brought some of that stuff to mind if you were familiar with some of their stuff, like from the mid to late 90s. It's kind of like some of it reminded me of. And, uh, yeah, I mean, like the first couple songs this are all just long, you know, 10, 15 minute songs, all droney, dark ambient style. And like I said, you know, not a whole lot of substance, but still looks quality for what it is. Whereas other two songs, uh, you know, kind of make a bigger use of uh, industrial characteristics and noise. And, uh, you know, the bass guitar and the normal guitar still, the way he uses is kind of different. I, know, I don't know that I've ever heard it exactly in, you know, exactly similar style and dark things. So he's kind of got his own thing going. It's pretty cool and, you know, unique, of course, too. Um, anyway, this artist, he's, you know, he's just getting going, and I think it's um, worth checking out if you're into something a little bit different. And, uh, this is available for, I think, like $10, maybe even less than his Bandcamp site. So it's worth checking out. If not, he's got several other digital singles that are available for free download or like a down free. So check it out if you're into something a little more, uh, a little more off, out there, and different. That's the Forest of Frogs. Up next is an album I've been listening to just quite a bit these past few months. It's an album I haven't really been able to get enough. It's just so fucking good. It's the latest album from Infinexuma called Unison. Uh, Unison is, for a self-released endeavor, is absolutely amazing. Um, I was already uh, really impressed with Lucas Levi-Leotard's first album, uh, and he just seems to be getting better and better with each album. And this one is just massive. I mean, just from the layout to the music contained within, it's just unbelievable. I mean, this is stuff that's like, should be on cryogen, or should be on Cyclic Law. But it's being self-released, which I think is partly his own decision, but it definitely deserves all the attention that uh, Luis and my label would otherwise get. And uh, this is an album that's just immensely cinematic. I, I mean, this is actually better than a lot of the records I've heard on Cryo Chamber in the past few months or even years. This is just, it's that good. I mean, this is a really, like, if you want a really great narrative dark camp, you know, this is truly the album to listen to. And, uh, I mean, it just feels like every little detail of this album is just so well thought out. And, I mean, you don't always get that with, like, every album you get, you know? It's just everything is just so perfected to a point where it's like, you can just put this album on and just lose yourself. It's that great. And, I mean, it, the only thing I can really say about the album that can be sort of a challenge is that it's almost two hours long. And it's an album that you really do have to, uh, you know, really focus it on. So... It's a bit of a long journey, but if you just, you know, allow yourself that time and the opportunity to take the journey with Infinix, then you're really going to be well rewarded here. Once again, field recordings are a pretty big part of uh, Infinix Huma sound, and it's a big part of, you know, making this all the more cinematic and just making it very, very vivid and very, just, you know, easily able to picture, you know, images in your brain as this in this record. Um, you know, atmospheric and just these are amazing soundscapes. I and mean, this is everything from, you know, I don't want to say typical dark gamut, but, you know, a traditional dark gamut sound to more droney atmospheres to, you know, like the cinematic sound you find in Cryo Chamber to even some really unexpected stuff. And there's even some, I guess, sort of somewhat harsher spots in this album, too. But then there's also, of course, really melancholy piano bits and uh, just really gorgeous melodies. I mean, the first album, I think, sort of had, I don't want to say, like, a more melodic or new age kind of sound, but it sort of had that feel in some parts, where the sound just really feels dark, like super dark in a lot of spots. And uh, it's really nice, like, like, it was really nice to see with this album. It really, you know, this is really dark. Well, once again, this is about the recycled soul, its journey after leaving the human host from suicide, and its continued journey now through a land called Unison. And uh, Unison is, uh, seems to be a forbidden land, but uh, Infinexuma has to continue his journey to eventually be reunited with his host. If not, it is sort of, I guess, in like a state of limbo forever? I don't know. But that's sort of the story that's being told here. And, I mean, again, it's not totally spelled out or right in front of you to listen to it, but you have to kind of make the story along as you go along. But it, there's such very vivid detail in this music that it really helps, and it's really easy to take like sort of picture it all in your brain as you go along. Um, I mean, everything about this album, just from, you know, 
the visuals and just all the music within it. I mean, like, you could almost, like, take parts of the sound, you could actually really, like, I don't know, maybe I just got a good imagination for stuff, but I could really just picture these scenes in my brain, especially the last song on the album where it's actually, like, uh, basically, like, uh, a preacher at a funeral kind of talking about the main character killing himself, then it goes into this sort of, uh, sort of really interesting, uh, I don't know how to put it in perspective, like, sort of, like, I don't want to say rockish kind of thing, but it's sort of like rock sounding, and like it's just like you can just totally picture this ending to like a sitcom, and like these images in your brain of like people mourning at a funeral, and then like this character sort of like moving on to another world, and it's it's really interesting. I don't know how to put it in perspective. Like it's really fucking unique. I've never seen anything like it in Dark Candy. kind of voice that pops in right away. It almost kind of sounds like the voices that you see in Adrian Carthur, or Adrian Cursory albums, kind of that sort of uh, narrative voice, and uh, also like songs like Suffocation are just deep, droning, long, you know, and I mean, long songs, I mean, I couldn't think of a better title than Suffocation. It really just sounds like losing air and just, you know, lose, like passing into sleep or just death. It's really immense. Freedom Window is also a really great song. It's just really, just really depressing, beautiful uh, piano melody at the beginning of it. Just really involved. I just love it. And, uh, yeah, I mean, there's lots of really great songs on the album. It's hard to really just kind of really highlight them all, but I mean, it's a two hour journey, like I said, so it's a bit to in take in, and you're really going to have to give it several listens. But once you really kind of give it those listens, it really starts to, uh, a part of you, you really get the whole narrative and it's really just this visual immense vivid thing it's just awesome and uh i mean i've listened to this album under a number of conditions too i mean i've done listen to it while i relax and i've listened to it while just doing stuff on the computer i was actually listening to it this morning while ripping out old carpet in one of my bedrooms upstairs <laughs> so it's kind of interesting probably not a lucas uh plan but you know I just like listening to dark ambient music in every possible situation. You know, you know, doing housework, why not? Yeah, once again, I mean, for a self-released album, this is uh, amazing. I mean, self-released albums just aren't normally as good. I mean, this, this looks a lot better and lots of stuff you see on a lot of labels. So I'm sure Lucas, you know, had to pr pay a pretty penny to make all this reality, but definitely well worth it. This is a fantastic record. And I mean, it was also mastered by Frederick at Cyclic Law, and I mean, I mean Anyone knows him knows even that knows how to master stuff. It makes it sound brilliant. This album is just immense. Um, also, one of the songs features the uh, Italian musician Neratore as a guest musician, and their song uh, is really fantastic too. As well, worth checking out. I've actually become pretty close friends with Alessio since uh, the song came out, and uh, we're actually collaborating some stuff right now. So I'm kind of interested to see what comes out of that in the future. So stay tuned for that too. Um, anyway, it's just a really fantastic album. I, I couldn't recommend it enough. This, uh, this album has gotten, like, it's gotten some good attention on his band camp site, but it definitely deserves more. This is probably one of the best Dark Ambient albums I've heard all year. And, uh, you know, yeah, Cryo Chamber and, you know, Winter Light and Cyclic Law, they all release great albums, but honestly, I think this is better than a lot of those albums. And again, if you're into Cryo Chamber stuff, Cinematic Dark Ambient, this album is one of the best I've heard in a really long time. I'm not just saying that because I'm friends with Lucas, because we formed a friendship and we've collaborated on songs, 
it's because he this is just a really fucking awesome album and uh, if you're into dark ambient music this is just simply an album you have to check out on the same the infinix you want so here's a little bit closer look at the awesome artwork that graces Unison. So here's the front cover, which is no doubt the recycled soul journeying through the forest. And I just love this sort of really ominous, kind of, you know, really melancholy cover with his purple haze on. It's really cool, I love it. And inside there's some text to kind of guide you along on the journey to get a little bit bigger insight. There's another look at the uh, recycled soul. And the inside with the two CDs. And uh, the back cover. Also. There is a special edition version of the song which comes with artifacts from Anderson, and it comes in this uh, little black pouch and cool little stuff in here. You get a key, oh, on focus, oh, okay, it's not gonna work out. Key. This is kind of cool, this is kind of plays on that sort of, you know, really interesting kind of visual aesthetic that uh, the Black Mara label from Russia has. They're focusing better now. Yeah, they have, like they always kind of that label always throws a bunch of really interesting little stuff in their packages to make it you know, physical releases a little more appealing. And Lucas definitely had that in mind when uh, creating this album. That's still not focusing very well, but whatever. You get to your, oh, there we go. <laughs> Super cool, really cool stuff. And uh, that version of the album, I believe, is available for like $20, so, like I said, just well worth picking up. This is a brilliant album, really just so well thought out, and just everything's really great about it. I mean, one of the one of the best you're going to hear this year, and honestly, one of the best I've heard in a really long time. So, again, fantastic album from Lucas Levi-Leotar and Infinix Yuma. the mask of the other, Volga, with the power to create, to root, and to merge. All shapes there to inhabit, all geometries there to unfold, a crowned head overlooking process. And they sang, sealed as one. Oh, you haven't left me. <laughs> this is good. Um, you caught me reading the Solar Zine. Uh, a, a basically, uh, sort of a, a zine, a magazine uh, created by Par Boostrom and his sister Asia which is basically like a, sort of an insight into their world, uh, information about their projects, their art, uh, studio notes, things like that. And uh, this came out a few months ago and it also came with the uh, Banini Borga cassette tape, which is a new project from Par. Par Bostrom is probably one of the most important dark Yandy musicians ever. This is a guy that's been going on since the late 90s. And uh, he debuted around 2003 with his album Asleep and Well Hidden, but had already become somewhat known a year earlier on the Nord Ambient Alliance compilation. Um, he is, makes, I would say, absolutely some of the most perfect dark ambient sounds he's ever conceived. Um, I first came across Kemmer Heights, his uh, first project, back in, I would say, 2004, probably. And uh, at the time, it was absolutely just something that resonated with me in a way that I can't even explain. It, uh, I could put his music on and just leave this world and go to a better place, I guess. Even though the music was dark and had this sort of actually haunting, melancholy vibe, it just really spoke to me in a world in a way like some music just had never really spoken to me before. And uh, you know, thinking back to that time frame in my life, I was extremely depressed. I was not doing well. I was on antidepressants, I was feeling pretty bleak about a lot of things, and uh, music like 
camera height and just, you know, anything, you know, in that sort of that fashion, it just really helped me in those times. I can't really explain it, but it's like you needed the, the darkness and the light to sort of balance yourself out, and it just all really collapsed and made sense back in those days, and I was able to, uh, you know, survive all that, uh, all the shit I was going through, and, you know, a lot, a lot of it was just, you know, I think teenage angst that would carry into my early 20s, but, you know, it was just one of those things I think a lot of people go through, and, you know, music saved me back in those days, you know, I used to think about that kind of shit a lot, you know, about, okay, well, you know, if, uh, if I took my life, would I ever be able to hear this wonderful music again, and, uh, me and Part first made contact uh, a few months ago, and uh, it was sort of just a random thing. He was asking me a question about uh, a tape service I had used, because he was in, he was thinking about making a tape of his own for some of his music. And from there, it just sort of blossomed into this relationship, and we occasionally, you know, talk, and we've even shared some personal information, and I found out in, like, a short while that he's just a really genuinely awesome guy. And, uh, you know, finding just genuinely awesome human beings these days is a rarity. And this guy, Park Oostrom, he is just, he's one of those guys. He's just really friendly. He's really, he's modest about his music. There's no arrogance in him. He's just, he, I don't know, he's a great guy. And uh, after we kind of talked and I shared some of my music with him, he uh, got into it and he enjoyed it. So I asked him about doing a trade. And uh, I sent him several Knock to Lucan releases. And he sent me a bunch of uh, his releases from uh, Camera Hide and all of his various side projects he's got going. So I thought about, you know, making this whole episode just talking about these projects, but I just wanted to kind of split it up into a couple episodes. So at least for this sixth episode, I'm going to just talk about two of those releases that he sent me, and uh, then we'll kind of go from there in future episodes, because he sent me like six, uh, six albums altogether, I think, or something like that. I have to check again. But it'll be a process to go through them, and I'm definitely going to do them all, because I'm so grateful for you sending those to me, Par. It's, it's amazing music, and I've listened to it obsessively since you sent them to me, and I can only hope that the music that, you know, I sent you was, you know, half as good. I mean, pretty hope. But really, truly, it means the world to me that you sent that music to me, and it's, again, you're just a fantastic dude, so thank you so much for doing that. So to start off, we'll talk about one of those newer projects from Har. It's called Banini Bolga. And it's a really interesting project. It has kind of some vibes similar to Kamar Hype, but this music is much more, I would say, like hypnotic, meditative, and just kind of really dreary and mysterious sounding. Um, it really kind of conjures up these feelings of just like being in this kind of like, I guess, like kind of like, I don't know, I, I, I create this mental picture of just like kind of wandering around like this foggy field at night. And, um, uh, it's just like seeing fog everywhere, just mysterious kind of, you know, strange beings everywhere, ghosts perhaps. It really was the vibe I got when listening to this record. And uh, so I got both the cassette version and the re-release by Cyclic Law. And uh, both packages are absolutely beautiful. And uh, this is just some really great stuff right here. So I'm going to show you this in a minute, but I just going to tell a quick story too. So the first time I was listening to this record, I was actually sitting on the couch reading and uh, as I often do when reading, I just sort of accidentally fall asleep and uh, fell asleep and, you know, I uh, continued to hear the music, of course, because I was sort of that, that sort of that weird state of being half awake, half asleep. And I had this strange kind of, I, I don't know if it was like a ghostly vision or something, but I had this weird experience where I felt like something was in the room with me. And it wasn't my girlfriend, because she was sleeping, so it wasn't that. Uh, I just had this weird experience of like while listening to this album that there was this ghost in the room with me looking at looking down at me So I don't know if that was like some weird out of, out, out of body experience or what but this music You know added being added a really interesting atmosphere to that and it was a strange soundtrack to this experience which Was probably just a dream, but you know, I mean I've had ghostly experiences before so I didn't ever rule anything out um, So, you know that was that and you know, I've continue to listen to this album since then and I really love it and uh great stuff just great just, just really deep meditative and just really just otherworldly sounding stuff and I mean just I don't know Parr's always just, just really unique style and just really nails with every release he does he's just so passionate just a master at this stuff and uh but Nini Bolgo is another just brilliant project and I really look forward to see what it comes up uh, in the future with this project okay so as I said Parr sent me both of uh, the cassette version and the CD re-release version by Cyclic Law. 
So I'll just show you the cassette version first. Um, it comes in this uh, basically like a homemade, well I don't know if it's homemade, but it's you know different that it's not a, a shell, it's basically just made out of paper and it just opens up like so. And within there's a Hypnagoga uh, business card. The cassette tape itself, of course. Side A and B. And then, uh, just a little bit better look at the packaging too. So. Cool. I mean, definitely different from a normal shell, but uh, that you get with uh, cassette tapes. I mean, there's always a potential that could get damaged, of course, but, you know, it's still, I like unique stuff, so I would say it's more appealing to me. And uh, there's a little uh, story of Benigni Bolga and some uh, really cool artwork to go along with it, of course. Really cool stuff. So that's the cassette version. I actually, uh, I haven't actually listened to the cassette tape yet because I'm freakishly afraid that it's going to get stuck in my uh, really crappy cassette player and I don't want that to happen. So I'm going to have to upgrade that one of these days, as I keep saying I'm going to, but until then, uh, I guess I'll just not listen to that and stick to the CD. So the CD is, uh, well, it, it obviously mirrors the cassette release with the artwork and all that, the visual layouts. Um, come, there's a little info sheet similar to the one in the cassette. And then, uh, I love it because it comes in this sort of fold-out, uh, I guess, cross-shaped like digipack, which, uh, it's remarkably similar to a uh, old release from a band called Catatonia on their album uh, Last Year Deal Gone Down, which is one of my all-time favorite albums as well. So it's really cool that it's got the same kind of visual look on the digipack. I love that. I just love these digitex to pull out like this. And there's the back. So super cool stuff, and I mean, you know, if you can get your hands on this album, definitely do so. The only problem where it becomes something of a pro problem is that if you live in the United States, you're going to have to pay a little extra for shipping, and it's an ear old prices. So that's also kind of a reason why, I, you know, I was so happy that it, Par wanted to do the trade with me because it, you know, just saved me all the trouble of going through all that, you know, conversions and all that stuff. And so it's just super awesome. One more, shall we? Femnambule is another project from Par Boostrum and his sister Aja. Um, Similar to a lot of the Pars projects, it has that deep, dark, droning, sort of melancholy, uh, haunting vibes that he's got throughout all his projects. But this is probably his most ambitious project to date. It's also, I would probably say, his most melodic project to date, too. It uh, features uh, organ, piano, flutes, and voices intermingled with all that deep, dark, droning ambient that you're kind of used to hearing from uh, Par Bostrum and his various projects. Um, but what really sets this one uh, dip from the other ones is just there's something really unique about it in that it's just really a lot more dreamy and really meditative and just, I mean this is an album where you just really close your eyes and just kind of, I mean I know I say that a lot about closing your eyes and kind of drifting away, but this album really just takes you to this really this fantasy world I guess of sorts, just this, this weird obscure place that's just amazing. I mean it's beautiful, beautiful music. I mean this, I, I don't know, these guys these two have just really come up with something really incredible on this record. Uh, I've been listening to the album just nonstop since he sent it to me and I, I mean this is just amazing. Plus the packaging for it is really uh, really ex excellent too, which we'll get to in a minute. Orgila Husset is a really, I guess I could say contemplative album. It really had me just uh, having these sort of melancholy visions of like my past and just, you know, it, it really had a lot of my younger days unfold in front of me as I just sat there listening to this album. It's really just one of those albums that just really makes you think about your life and just really makes you think like where you're going, where you've been, what you've done. It has this really dreamy, melancholy atmosphere, but like a lot of music in that kind of stuff, there's this looming sort of a sense of hope at the end of it and it's just really an album that just, you know, I don't know, it's like you just have these visions of like sort of being in this weird, lush land where just like uh, everything is just sort of, I don't know, I don't want to say everything's happy or that, but, but it's just, it, it, I found this music really calming and but it's even with that sort of melancholy sense, it really just made me feel something really special when listening to it. And uh, I mean, 
I don't know, this is a record I've just listened to time and time again since Power sent it to me. It just it keeps unre- unraveling more and more things to me, and it's just really freaking amazing. And not to mention that the, the digipack, or not the digipack, but the sleeve and the, uh, the album artwork inside is really immense too. So let's check that out now, shall we? I also have to mention that this is probably his most melodic work to date. And the, you know, the piano and the organ and melodies are not like overly complex in any way. But it really adds a special sense to the his, uh, his otherwise like deep dark droning music, and the addition of the flute really adds a sort of I guess like really obscure almost like sounds almost like Middle Eastern in a way the the uh, the way it sounds it's really special really amazing I just love it I mean this is just a brilliant brilliant record I mean this is one where you know 10 20 years down the road we're still gonna be talking about this and this is a I think this is going to be another just totally iconic album that's going to be re-released time and time again over the ages. It's just, it's an amazing album. Perhaps Parr's uh, most ambitious and most uh, rewarding project to date so far. Well, that's it for episode six, guys. And as usual, I have to thank you, thank you, thank you for tuning in and spending a little time with me while I talk about dark ambient music. As I've said many times before, this is something I've been into for many, many years and something I love and adore with all my heart. So I'm just glad that I can, you know, share a little bit of that with you and hopefully get you into some cool new releases and, you know, spread the word on dark ambient music. So, as I always say at the end of these videos, I'll be back. I don't know when, but I'll be back. And uh, other than that, it's almost Christmas time, so watch out for Krampus and say fuck you to Jesus. Alright, see you guys next time. Bye.